Okay. Welcome all to the 2020 Fall for the Book Festival. My name is Jennifer DeSano, and I have the honor of being the Chairman of the Board of Directors for the Festival and the Executive Director of the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute here at George Mason University. But most importantly, like all of you, I am a reader. And today I have the privilege to moderate this panel of extremely talented authors on the topic of painted worlds where history and fiction blend. All Fall for the Book Festival events are free and held virtually for you to enjoy from September through November. You can find the full schedule of Fall for the Book's uh, offerings at fallforthebook.org and be sure to follow us on Crowdcast. You can do that by clicking the Fall for the Book icon above this window and then clicking Follow. This presentation is sponsored by the Fairfax Library and Friends Thank you so much for your contribution and support of the book. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce our esteemed novelist. Uh, Marco Rafala is a first-generation Sicilian-American novelist, musician, and writer for award-winning tabletop role-playing games. He earned his MFA in fiction from the New School and is a co-curator of the Gorilla Lit reading series in New York City. He was born in Middletown, Connecticut, he now lives in Brooklyn, New York. His fiction and nonfiction have appeared in the Bellevue Literary Review and Lit Hub. How Fires End is his debut novel, and he is a finalist for the 2020 Connecticut Book Awards. Julie Oranger is the New York Times bestselling author of the novels The Invisible Bridge and The Flight Portfolio and How to Breathe Underwater, a collection of stories. She has received fellowships from the Guggenheim Foundation, the National Endowment for the Arts, the Coleman Center at the New York Public Library, the McDowell Colony, and the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study at Harvard. She lives in Brooklyn, New York with her husband and children. Tracy Anderson Wood is a playwright, screenwriter, and novelist from a multi-generational military family. She has authored magazine columns and other nonfiction for publications serving the military and military families, and written and directed plays of various length. She served as an active duty spouse for many years, working for military health and support services, both professionally as a registered nurse and as a volunteer. The Engineer's Wife is her debut novel. She resides in St. Petersburg, Florida. Welcome to all of you. <laughs> I enjoyed reading each of your works. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I'm sure our audience has many questions for each of you, and let me share those watching that we will have Q&A time throughout the presentation via the chat feature to allow participants to offer up their curiosities and uh, queries. And if time allows at the end, we'll do more questions uh, following our formal discussion. The books we will discuss today are historical fiction novels set in several different time periods and geographies. Uh, Marco Rafala's How Fires End journeys the reader on a family saga from the Sicilian hillside to a Sicilian neighborhood in Connecticut. Julie Oranger's The Flight Portfolio is a tale of courage and helping artists flee the Nazis great peril. And Tracy Anderson Wood's novel the engineer's wife asks the question, who really built the Brooklyn, Brooklyn Bridge? <laughs> Each novel has fictional characters and real life characters using fact and fiction to shape, enrich and illuminate the narrative. So let's begin our conversation by getting to know your specific character inspiration for each of your novel uh, in turn. And we'll, we can, uh, we're gonna talk about Barry and Fry we're going to talk about the Sicilian family as a whole in Marco's book, uh, or perhaps you'd like to speak specifically to a certain character development, and Emily Warren Wilby. So we can start with you, Julie. Okay, well, thank you. Um, I'm so pleased to be here and be part of Fall for the Book. Um, and um, I'll just begin by telling you a little bit about how I came across Barry and Fry. Um, as I was researching my previous novel, which took place in France and Hungary during the Second World War, um, I learned just by chance that there had been an American uh, journalist and editor who went to Marseille in 1940 
with a mission of saving writers and artists blacklisted by the Gestapo. And I came across his memoir as I was researching the Franco-German armistice. Um, it happens to have the same name as one of the articles of the armistice, Article 19, which is called the Surrender on Demand Clause. Um, and that clause essentially stipulated that the Germans could deport any current or former German national living in France at the time for um, legal process and um, internment in Germany. And, uh, and so I read Varian's memoir and I learned that this one American had taken it upon himself to form an organization with a few others that was um, focused on identifying and raising money for and then achieving the immigration of writers and artists who were well known and who were in peril because of their their political views um, in and who had fled to France from the occupied countries. So he actually went to France for about 13 months and tried to find the 200 writers and artists on his list and figure out ways to get them out of the country, get papers for them, raise money so that they could buy their steamer tickets, find boats that would actually take them across. Um, and, um, and his story itself was so fascinating, but what was really intriguing about him as a character for a novel was that he was so conflicted about his mission and the idea that um, that he had to make these choices about whom to save based upon their artistic prowess and reputation. Um, he, his views on that subject changed considerably over the course of his time in Marseille, and that was what really made him fascinating as a novel character. Thank you so much, Julie. Um, Marco, would you like to talk about your character? Sure. Um, so, um, so there's uh, Salvatore and Nella, and they're both um, born in Malili, Sicily. And then there's Vincenzo, who is a, uh, an Italian soldier during the war who deserts. Um, and then there is uh, David, who is an American, the American born son of Salvatore. And really the, the novel takes these, the communities from Malili, Sicily and uh, Middletown, Connecticut, um, because, and there are a lot of stories about the very first person from Malili who ever came to Connecticut and then everyone else who came after. Um, so those two communities really felt larger than life to me. Uh, I grew up listening to all of those stories uh, from my father and, and my cousins and aunts and uncles. Um, and I think, as you said, it really is the Sicilian family that um, is at the heart of the book. And for me, the, there was this question of what is a Sicilian American story that isn't about the mafia. So that's why the um, the story of this family, of these two families, actually, um, is at the center of the book. Very good. And, and Tracy, do you want to talk? About, tell us about Emily. Emily. Well, as Jennifer mentioned, uh, I'm in a multi generational military family, and I discovered Emily because I was searching for a family to write about that was a multi-generational family doing something that was dangerous, that they had sort of a, a family occupation that also might kill them. This was a concept I wanted to write about. I actually wanted to write a play, but um, so my, at the time my son was in um, EOD, a very danger, dangerous army occupation, the bomb squad guys who go out there and get the IEDs and blow them up or get rid of them. So he was doing that. My husband, also in the army for many years, now now retired. My uh, brother was a jet pilot. So anyway, this is what I wanted to write about. Like, what happens if you have a family that does something that also may kill you? Because I was really interested in the family dynamics. And I wanted to write uh, about the New York City area because I grew up in, in New Jersey and that was sort of Oz to me. And I wanted to write like maybe a, a family of architects that were building those skyscrapers, you know, like in the, the pictures you see with the guys all sitting on the girders, you know, a hundred stories up and they're sort of eating lunch, you know? <laughs> so I'm like, what if there's a father of tiptoes out there to give lunch to his son and what happens when they go home? And, uh, mm. but anyway, I couldn't find that family. But in my research, what I did find was the Roebling family. And here you had John Roebling was a, a very prominent engineer in Germany uh, who for many reasons 
uh, this, it was Prussia at the time, couldn't do what he wanted to do. So he uh, emigrated to the US to do his dream, which was to build bridges and uh, other engineering process. So this is the story I, I found. I found there was John who came over and then you know he dies and uh, Washington, his son, tries to take over their dream project, which is the Brooklyn Bridge. And then he can't get it done either. And it falls to the wife, Emily Roebling, who is not a trained engineer, has really not much interest in it. She really, I mean, this is all factual, wanted to be uh, work for the women's right to vote and was very active in those kind of things, but just sort of gets sucked into this huge, huge project. And so I discovered this family, which was, you know, yeah, it, it, it was a dangerous occupation. And, and here it is this unknown woman, Emily, who basically saved the day and we don't know about her. Mm -hmm. So that's when, you know, that was the aha moments. Like I have to write about Emily Roebling. Nobody knows the story. And the Brooklyn Bridge is such an icon. Uh, it, it's funny now, I mean, I can never turn on the news or, uh, pick up a book hardly, it seems, without seeing a picture and a mention of something of the Brooklyn Bridge. If there's a story about the world, then they're going to talk, okay, and here's the US. What city do they show? New York. What do they show in New York? The Brooklyn Bridge. So I I just, I had to do it and I'm so glad I did because I, I love all my characters. <laughs> well, we're, we're so glad you did too. It was a pleasure, pleasure to read all of your books actually. And I learned a lot from, uh, from all of the experiences that you shared. And I think we've properly teased the audience enough now so that we should probably listen to you give a bit of a reading if each of you want to give us a, a flavor for your book. I'll start Julie. Well, and I'll have to go get my book. <laughs> oh, you go get your book and then... <laughs> Marco, why don't we start? So this is a um, excerpt of the prologue and the uh, narrator is Nella. My father told my brothers and me the story of how the statue of St. Sebastian came to the village of Malili, the village we once called home. Like so many stories, this one started with danger. A ship was caught in a furious storm and ran aground in Magara Bay. The hull cracked open on the rocks and the waves pushed our saint ashore. All the sailors survived. They thanked their cargo for their lives. But none of these men could lift the statue to carry it off. Word spread first among the shepherds, then to the local villages and cities, until news reached the bishop of Siracusa. In three days, he came with clergy and a crew of men to claim the saint. Again, the saint was too heavy to lift. From all over the province, people gathered on the beach, waiting their turn to try to break the spell and lift the statue. Some of the men built a fire. Some of the women cooked. At night, they prayed. And in the day, their prayers failed them. When the procession from Malili arrived, our priest claimed the statue, saying, since the making of the world, St. Sebastian has been painted here on the grotto wall in our village, here before even Sebastian himself was born. This is Malili, the martyr Sebastian, tied to a tree and porcupined with Roman arrows. Then our men raised the statue on a wooden pallet and placed the poles upon their shoulders, and a great cheer went up among them as all the clergy prayed and made the sign of the cross. He is one of our own, they shouted, first God, and then St. Sebastian. Another cheer seized the men, and they carried the saint home, our ancestors, a Vasallo and a Borello among the bearers. Our families held hands and sang together, bringing their patron saint home to Novelli. In the piazza, on the ridge overlooking the bay, their knees buckled. The men cried out. A force had suddenly burdened them with a weight they could no longer carry. The priest kissed the wooden crucifix around his neck and said, No man can shoulder the might of God. So they left the statue there and built a church around it. This was May 1414. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. I always get to take a breath <laughs> between readings. <laughs> Tracy, would you like to share? Sure. 
Well, first I'd like to say, Marco, oh my gosh, you have a beautiful reading voice. Will you, will you do mine? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Just beautiful voice. So that's the cover. Uh, I'd like to read the first part of chapter 12, which is very early in the, before the bridge is actually built, during the time they're doing the, the surveying for where the, the bridge is going to be built. And Emily at this point is really not in, involved at all, but it's sort of when she starts to be. It was late. Wash had requested my presence at the waterfront at 9 a.m. sharp, but Johnny captivated me, squealing in delight as we sprawled on the floor in his room, bouncing a rubber ball between us. Now scampering about on two sturdy legs and beginning to talk, he was at the age when a mother falls in love with her baby all over again. His squeals made me laugh and squeal with him. Mother snapped her fingers for our attention. Emily, you have 15 minutes to get down there. She made a grand wave towards the door. Now shoo. I picked up Johnny, gave him a squeeze and kissed the top of his head, taking in his soapy baby scent. Thank you, mother. You really ought to procure a nanny. She pulled my squirming, protesting baby away. We're managing well without one. I spoke through clenched teeth inwardly. I agreed with her, but felt obliged to support the opinion of Wash, who felt raising our son ourselves was a more modern approach. I kissed the soft pink hands Johnny held out to me. Donning my hat and gloves, I hurried out the front door. The coachman paced the cobblestones in front of our carriage. A gust of wind stole the little green cap off my head and he bent to retrieve it. Apparently, Eleanor's hairpins couldn't substitute for a decent hairpin. The end of June in New York can be clammy and chilly or full of glorious sunshine, a harboring of warm days to come. That particular day was one of the former unpleasant sort. The air was scented with the coal fires of winter and I berated myself for not bringing a wrap. The clickety clack of the wheels seemed to tick off each maddening second during the brief ride to the waterfront. A deep fog had settled in overnight, but change was in the air as the wind picked up, breaking blue holes in the sky. On a ridge above the shoreline, swirling puff puffs of white gauze parted, revealing children wearing short coats as they played in the street. The muddy brown East River slowly reappeared full of choppy whitecaps as it made its way toward the narrows. We stopped at the waterfront where small waves lapped sand and pebbles. The dra driver offered his arm as I stepped out, considerable relief on his face to have delivered his charge far less on time. I made out my father-in-law's unmistakable frame and purposeful stride along the pier that ran be beside the ferry slip and took in a deep breath, breath to brace myself. Years of meetings, speeches, and hard work had raised enough funds to get the project movement moving. I had expected a small crowd and reporters from newspapers, but only Wash and a worker setting up a tripod were present on the narrow ribbon of shoreline. Ah, there you are, my lovely. Wash beamed at me as I stood above him on the pier. In some ways, he was so very much like his father, calm, calculated, methodical. But Papa lacked his son's warmth, the openness and playfulness that drew me in. When work went well, Wash was happy and engaging. Indeed, now he was engaged up to his shins in river muck, shoveling dirt into small mounds. This is Mr. Young, father surveyor. Foreman, as of yesterday, Mr. Young corrected with a tip of his cap. He was of medium height and build, dishwater brown hair and cheeks scarred from youthful blemishes. Many men, including Jake GK, hid them with beards, but Mr. Young had no such vanity. He pieced together his tripod, compass, and scope and fiddled with its settings. Please pardon my tardiness, I glanced around. There was no one but the seagulls, whose cries seemed to berate my absence for the special event. Did I miss the ceremony? Johnny had just watched laughed. It's a big moment for us, but not enough fanfare to interest the public. His eyes sought Papa, who was at the end of the pier looking across the river through a spyglass. Father wasn't interested even in this bit of ceremony. To Young, he said, even though he's been obsessed with building this bridge since I was 10. I know, Young said. I've been with him almost that long. You made a wise choice heading off to war. As it turns out, the escape was only temporary, said Wash. 
The fog was lifting and I could make out a flash of red across the water on the Manhattan shore. Relief at not having disappointed them lifted me as well. Wash waved young away from the tripod and peered, peered through the scope. Father has made contact. He turned to us and lifted his shovel. In an official tone, he pronounced, and now with two witnesses, I proclaim the New York and Brooklyn Bridge project to be officially underway. He plunged his shovel deep into the muck and I clapped at his proclamation. I better go tell Mr. Roble. I glanced at the pier, but only a wisp of fog marked where Papa had stood. Where? He probably went out on the rocks to get a better view. Wash shrugged his boot pressing on the shoulder of the shovel, scraping it into the grit. I hurried down the weathered gray boards of the pier, picking up my skirts to avoid tripping. I shuddered at the thought of having to leap into the brown water to save Papa. Despite my experience in Europe, I still loathed rivers. I pushed those thoughts away. A person shouldn't allow one tragedy to cause yet another. As I approached the end of the pier, there was Papa jumping from one to another, unattached piling. My panic ebbed, relief washing over me. I called to him as he clambered among the boulders, black and slick with river slime, jutting out of the water past the pilings, but my voice faded into the fog. Busy with his footwork, he didn't see me. He carried a red signal flag, its staff about 10 feet tall. A gust of wind made it snap sharply and caused him to teeter on the slippery rock. He knelt down to gain stability, waves lapping at his knees while he lifted the spyglass that hung from a strap around his neck and peered across the water. As Papa lifted his signal flag, the ghostly image of a double-decked ferry appeared through the fog, blocking the view across the river. Trails of black soot streamed from its twin smokestacks and commuters crowded the rails fore and aft of the paddle wheel. Papa checked his pocket watch and shook his head. The ferry probably didn't keep a schedule as precise as his own. As Papa could see neither see nor hear me, I turned back to wash. A gust of salty wind made me shiver and I rubbed my arms, longing for the warmth of the nursery. If I returned home now, there was still time to play with Johnny before his nap. Wash was drawing lines in the shoreline with a shovel and speaking to Young. We drilled core samples in this area and hit bedrock at 40 feet. He looked at me and said, did you tell him? No, he needs all his concentration to perform acrobatics on the pilings. And now he seems upset that the ferry is in his way. Watch scratched his beard. Ha, he hates ferries. The ferry approached Papa's signal flag, the churn of its engines growing louder, but something was amiss. The ferry was traveling far too quickly as if the land had popped out of the fog before it was expected. I ran back down the pier. A moment later, Wash and Young's heavy boots pounded the boards behind me. The ferry made its turn toward the pier and once again blocked the view across the river. Late again, blasted ferry boat, Papa yelled from his perch atop a black boulder. You'll soon be replaced by real engineering, you bucket of bolts. He shook his fist at the boat, passengers waved back. I cut my hands around my mouth and yelled, Papa, get back here. An aura of foreboding filled me, sensing a danger that Papa did not. He waved to me, climbing off the rocks and stepped across the pilings toward the pier. The boat barreled ahead, dangerously off course, heading for the pilings rather than the slip. Slow her down, Papa yelled. The wind picked up, blowing hard off the water and drenching him in waves that smashed against the pilings. Passengers cried out, thrust off their feet as the boat overcorrected in its course in a rapid turn. The ferry came straight at Papa, blowing its horn. He tossed aside the, the signal flag and stepped quickly across the pilings. Climbing, climbing up the iron struts on the corner post of the pier, his right boot became jammed between a strut and the ferry boat slip, leaving his foot hanging over the empty slip. A loud blare of the horn filled the air longer this time. I froze in place watching in horror and not knowing how to help without risking my own life. Wash caught up with me. Father, get away from there. To me, I would get back as he climbed down towards Papa. I tried to follow him thinking the two of us could safely move Papa out of danger, but Young grabbed my shoulders. Please ma'am, stay here. He rushed to help Wash. Papa, move. I stayed out of the way, frightened and useless as an ant under a falling tree. The ferry horn blew long and loud. Then there was nearly drowned out by the gnashing of engine's gears as they ground into reverse. The paddle wheel frothed the water as it strained to change direction. Passengers crowded the rails, yelling and gesturing frantically. 
Instead of an ant, I became a girl struggling against the raging river current. Papa struggled to pull his boot from the crevice, lost his balance and nearly fell in the water. He tried to unlace his boot, but was unable to untie the knot. The ferry slammed into the freestanding pilings and snapped them with a loud crack. The boat shifted sideways from the impact and slammed into the end of the pier, its boards shaking beneath me. Wooden planks heaved and crumpled from the force, pulling Papa toward the water and further entangling his foot. I screamed for Papa. I screamed for Elizabeth. No, the river must not take another. <laughs> wow. Thank you so much, Tracy. Thank you. You're welcome. I remember reading that scene and was like, ugh. <laughs> <laughs> Very well done. Thank you so much. Thank you. Julie? Yeah, well, maybe I'll uh, just read a page or so from the beginning of the book, if that's going to sure. be appropriate for our time. Um, so this is from the first section of the book, um, which is called Despise What Is Not Courage. Uh, it's a line from an E.E. E. Cummings poem. And the first chapter is called Gord, which is a French, uh, it's a place name from the south of France. There was, as it turned out, no train to the village where the Chagalls lived, one of many complications he failed to anticipate. He had to pay a boy with a motorbike to run him up from the station at Cavaillon, 10 miles at a brain-shaking pace along a narrow, rutted road. On either side rose ochre hills striated with grapevines and lavender and olive trees. Overhead, a blinding white-veined sky. The smell was of the boy's leather jacket and of charred potatoes, excellent of his clever homemade fuel. At the foot of the village, the boy parked in a shadow, accepted Varian's francs, and tore off into the distance before Varian could arrange a ride back. The streets of Gord, carved into a sunstruck limestone hill above the Luberon Valley, offered little in the way of shade. He would have given anything to be back in Marseille with a glass of aperol before him, watching sailors and girls, gangsters and spice vendors parading the Canabier. The Chagalls had only agreed to see him on the basis that he not bring up the prospect of their emigration. But what other subject was there? The Nazis had taken Paris months ago. They were burning books in the streets of Alsace. They could send any refugee over the border at will. At least the Chagalls had agreed. That was something. But as he reached the house, an ancient Catholic girls' school on the Rue de la Fontaine Basse, he found himself fighting the urge to flee. His credentials, if anyone examined them, amounted to a fanatic's knowledge of European history, a desire to get out from behind his desk in New York, and a deep frustration with his isolationist nation. And yet this was his job. He'd volunteered for it. What was more, he believed he could do it. He raised his hand and knocked. An eye appeared in the brass circlet of the peephole, and a girl in a striped apron opened the door. She listened, strangling her index finger with one dark curl as he stated his name and mission. Then she ushered him down a corridor and out into a courtyard where a stone path led to a triangle of shade. There at a bare wooden table, Chagall and his wife sat at lunch, the painter in his smock, his hair swept back from his forehead in silver waves, Bella in a close-fitting black dress too hot for the day. Ah, Monsieur Fry, Chagall said, rising to meet him. The painter's eyes were large and uncommonly sharp, his expression one of bemusement. You've come after all. I thought you might. You won't forget our agreement, will you? All I want is your company for an hour. You're lying, of course, but you lie charmingly. They sat together at the table, Bella on Varian's left, the painter on his right, he, Varian Fry, sitting down with the Chagalls, with Chagall, author of those color-saturated visions, those buoyant bridal couples and intelligent-eyed goats he'd seen in hush rooms at the Museum of Modern Art. Bella filled a plate with brown, hard-crusted niche, soft cheese, sardines crackling with salt. She handed it across the table, assessing Varian in silence. Had you been here a few days ago, we would have had tomatoes, Chagall said. A farmer brings them up to the market on Thursdays. I'm sorry we don't have more to offer. The bread's a little hard on the tooth, I'm afraid, but c'est la guerre. This is lavish, Varian said. You're too kind. Not at all. We like to share what we have. He gestured around him at the bare yellow stones, the rough benches, the shock of gold-green hillside visible through an archway in the wall. As you see, we're living a quiet and retired life in our little dasha. No one will bother us here at Gord. You have a studio, Varian said. You're still producing work. 
That's what makes you dangerous. Our daughter says the same, Bella said. She's been saying it for months. But you understand, Monsieur Fry, my husband's reputation will protect him. Vichy wouldn't dare touch us. With respect, Madame Chagall, I don't believe that for a moment. Vichy is subject to the Nazis' whims, and we all know what they're capable of. I've seen it myself. I was in Berlin in 35, sent by the magazine I worked for. My last night in town, there was a riot on the Kurfürstendamm. The things I saw, men pulled from their shops and beaten in the streets, an old man stabbed through the hand at a cafe table, boys dragging a woman by her hair. These things happened in Germany, Chagall said, his tone harder now. They won't happen here, not to us. Let me speak to my friend at the consulate, Darian said. Ask him to start a file for you at least. If you do decide to leave, it might take months. Chagall shook his head. My apologies, Monsieur Fry. I'm sorry you had to come all this way in vain. But perhaps you'd like to have a look at the studio before you go. If you finish, that is. Varian couldn't speak. He could scarcely believe that a person of Chagall's intelligence, a person of his experience, could fail to see what he himself saw clearly. Chagall rose and crossed the courtyard to a set of ten-foot-high blue doors, and Varian got to his feet. He nodded his thanks to Bella and followed Chagall across the broken paving stones. Beyond the blue doors was a long, high-ceiling room with a wall of windows, the former refectory of the girls' school. Canvases lay about everywhere, and for long minutes, Varian walked among them in silence. As well as he knew the painter's work, he had never seen it like this, in its pupil state, damp and mutable, smelling of turpentine, raw wood, wet clay. From the canvases rose ghost-like images, a grave-eyed Madonna hovering above a shadowed town serenaded by cows and angels, crucified Christ wrapped in a prayer shawl, his head encircled by grieving sages, a woman kneeling beside a river, pressing a baby to her chest, clusters of red and white flowers rising like flames. It's no small matter to cross an ocean, Chagall said. More can be lost than canvas and paint. An artist must bear witness, Monsieur Fry. He cannot turn away, even if he wishes to. I'll stop there. Very good, thank you so much, Julie. So uh, we, I wrote a few questions uh, for us to talk about, and I just got a prompt from the audience, which is sort of a repeat of the question I wrote. So I'm going to ask you this. Um, I'm curious about the choice of historical fiction as a genre uh, overall and its, and its liberations and its trappings. Um, and I'm talking now of kind of living memory of events, timelines, um, that may touch readers who have lived through or had a connection, uh, even an academic connection with these subjects, uh, events and characters. And, um, and I, wanna, wanna, I wanna know as authors, how much artistic license do you feel comfortable taking to embellish or extrapolate or enrich the, the true story as, as much as the truth is the truth? Um, and alternatively, do you feel writing historical fiction is a, a brilliant, for limitless ideas and imagination. And um, who would like to, uh, how about Mark go? Or is it, give you time to digest the question. <laughs> um, sure. Um, I actually didn't, I didn't think or I didn't know that I was writing historical fiction as I was working on the book, even though um, the very first scene that I wrote was from Salvatore's perspective as a child during the Second World War in Sicily. I don't know why it just never dawned on me that I was writing historical fiction. Other people had to tell me that's what I was doing. Um, and I was, you know, I sort of pushed back against that. I don't know. I just thought that it just never entered my mind. Um, do I, I, I took a lot of artistic liberties with, um, with the actual events of 1943 in Melilla, Sicily, um, I played with, you know, geography a little bit, suit the fiction. Um, I did, um, I did, I, I changed certain things to um, protect people in my family. Um, but I don't, I don't find, I don't find the genre limiting at all. I mean, the next book I'm working on is um, set completely in Sicily during the Allied invasion. Um, and I'm, I'm not feeling limited by that at all. Thank you. Tracy, do you want to speak to uh, 
that you, you, you touched on the end of the Civil War and you know the, the, the kind of industrializing or the building out of New York City and all of the changes that were going on then and, and who was in charge of the bosses and all of that kind of thing. Um, how did you feel about writing the historic fiction genre, knowing there would be so much knowledge about the subject? Right, well, historical fiction, a lot depends on the era you're writing about and how much is known uh, or not known about the era. And the further you go back in time, the more license basically you have to make things up because there isn't that much known. The closer you get to the present, sometimes uh, the more accurate you need to be or you know, within uh, some historical fact. Um, or if you're mentioning real live people, you know, and many of my characters were actual people. So, you know, you have a responsibility as an author to not write things, I think, that couldn't be true. There is things that are fact and are known, and you work those into the story as much as possible. But for the things that you don't know, for example, dialogue and relationships and actual personal thought, those are, those are the things you make up. And I felt, you know, complete license to do that as long as I felt that it's something that could have happened, but we just don't know. I mean, the reason I read and write historical fiction is because I love history. I like, you know, it's, I think everybody should have a good handle on history. You know, if we don't remember history, we're condemned to repeat it, right? So I, I find it fascinating, but it also can be very dry because when you're writing nonfiction, everything has to be documented. You can't write something that didn't happen and isn't documented three, four different ways. And so you can't put in things like emotions and relationships and dialogue. And those are all the things that make reading fun, right? It makes it entertaining. So I love historical fiction in that I can learn about things and yet be entertained and imagine really what it was like to be in that time. So that's why I write it. And that's sort of the way I wrote it, that I you know, write the facts, the important facts. I didn't change where the bridge was or when major things happen or uh, how it came together, but I did need to imagine the relationships, the dialogue and all the stuff that you know makes a novel a novel. Thank you so much. Julie? Yeah, Tracy, I really love what you're saying about looking for the places where history sort of leaves a blank or allows us some space to envision what might have happened. Um, yeah, it's interesting. I, I had not before written a novel that centered upon a well-known real person. Um, it was not something that I set out to do thinking I'm going to write historical fiction per se. More it was like I'm fascinated by this guy and want to understand who he was. Um, and in the process of doing so, I found myself um, learning much more about a history that I felt was not well no enough known um, and that, uh, that could, in a very particular way, illuminate something that I think is really important for us to grasp at this political moment, which is that one person's responsibility, one person's sense of fervor for what he believed could in fact change many thousands of lives. Um, and so in going about this, I was not only looking to capture that story accurately and to represent the historical facts accurately and to, um, to bring to light what was actually going on in Marseille at the time when there were so many refugees having fled there from the occupied countries and from other, where, other uh, locations in France, but, but also to look for the parts of Varian Fry's story that hadn't been told, that could not have been told at that time. Um, one of the things I understood from my research was that Varian Fry was gay um, and that he had a number of quite important relationships that altered the course of his life, both before and during his time in Marseille. Um, but very little had been written about those relationships. And so I um, I essentially envisioned a relationship that he might have during his time in Marseille that would have been, that could have existed plausibly alongside what he did do, um, but that might not have been captured because so many gay relationships were simply not written about at the time because it was just sort of considered too far outside of, of what was socially acceptable. Um, and so in, uh, in envisioning that relationship, 
I drew upon a truth that had been submarined in a way, a truth that could not have, have emerged. Um, and what, what was really interesting about, um, about that was that after the book was published, there was some protest um, from the critics about you know, why I had chosen to invent Barry and Fry's homosexuality and, and some outrage um, about my choice for the, for the book. And it actually took a letter to the New York Times by Barry and Fry's son saying, my father was gay and we should talk about that as a fact of his life. And that must become part of the way we understand his experience so that we can know um, more about you know, how his, his person might have shaped his actions. Um, and also that, so that we can talk about what's really important, which is what he did, the, the life-saving mission that brought to the States people like Chagall and like Hannah Arendt and Max Ernst and Andre Berton and Jacques Lipschitz and so many other incredible artists and writers uh, who then ended up sort of shaping the landscape of the 20th century. And this kind of leads to um, when, when you're talking about the things that the unspoken things at the time, the pressures, the societal behaviors and expectations that uh, the characters of the people uh, were going through, um, religion, uh, sexuality, equality issues, mm -hmm. um, personal conflicts that were both internal and external. Um, these pressures force characters to take either bold leaps or um, and somehow reconcile their feelings um, to address these pressures, but sometimes that came out with dire consequences to themselves, or they were worried that there would be dire consequences to themselves or others. Um, do you want to give us some specifics? Uh, do you want to let us know some specifics on, I know you spoke, Julie, of, of Barry and Fry being gay and how that might affect him, but um, what were some specific pressures that affected your primary characters? Um, Marco? You cut out. What was the question? Okay. So what, how, how do these pressures affect your primary characters? How, how are societal pressures, family pressures, religious pressures in your case? Mm -hmm. um, how are those driving the behaviors of your characters? Sure. Well, there's the, um, I think the the largest pressure is this uh, the idea of machismo um, and how David Salvatore's American-born son um, doesn't live up to that. So those um, and that pushes him to do uh, to get into conflicts with a bully and to and to sort of push that envelope and to try to um, appease his father so that his father doesn't think that he's a wimp or that he can't take care of himself. Um, so I think that's the that's one of the large ones that plays throughout the novel, that David's life would be different without that, without that influence. Throughout throughout the community too, and, and the way right. that, you know this this particular segment of the Sicilian um, carryover into the American world too of, of that um, that sort of expectation men are to be men, you know. And right, that, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what is the idea of men, you know? Mm -hmm. um, Tracy, um, your character is struggling with just her own personal evolution in a time when women weren't really expected to do engineering jobs <laughs> or take on um, political uh, challenges to demand the right to vote and so forth. So some of those are pretty obvious pressures. Do you, do you want to explore that with us in your character? Sure. Um, you know, Emily was facing pressures from both sides. I mean, heavy pressure, of course, from the family because this was a family project. They wanted to keep it in the family. They didn't want anybody to know that uh, the men in charge were not in charge. Uh, so she had that extreme pressure that it was all on her. At the same time, of course, society was telling her, like, you can't do it. And in fact, blaming her when th bad things happened, as they did, blaming it on the fact that she was a woman. You know, uh, an example would be when um, a character was uh, 
killed on the site by, not historical by the way, by a crane moving a, a rock and slamming into Guy with flying and they blamed it on her because she's a woman and he got distracted by looking at her, <laughs> you know? So uh, that part's fictional, but uh, you can easily imagine it happen. Yeah, and she was constantly uh, threatened to be thrown into jail and, uh, and had to, uh, although I didn't find actual historical reference to her paying out because that, you know, paying bribes, basically that wouldn't have been recorded because the whole point of it is that it goes away, but just reading between the lines that, uh, that's the sort of thing that happened. I mean, she had her bribe her way through the job just to do her job and to, you know, and the main thing she needed for her job would have been an engineer engineering degree, which she wasn't allowed to get. So, you know, just, many, many conflicts on many different levels due to her death, of course. With, um, thank you, thank you, Tracy. With the um, World War II experience with, with the, the oppression that was being filled by the, the Vichy and the, in, in France and, and the, the refugees that were struggling with being completely suffocated, essentially. Uh, one of the scenes in your book, Julie, that, that might speak to this is the surrealist dinner party where they, they have a game of taboo, where they just kind of are giving themselves a, a, a license to be able to say what they want to say um, within reason. What It's like an opportunity to kind of relieve the pressure uh, that, they're, that they're under. There's some interesting things that kind of come out of that, that dinner party. Um, so uh, like everyone in your book is under pressure societally and, and what's happening in the world at the moment. It's wartime. Do you want to speak to that? Yeah. Um, well, there are two parts of that that I think are really interesting. The first is that um, when I showed this book to a dear friend of mine, a, an incredible novelist who I'm lucky enough to have lived in my neighborhood and uh, who I exchange work with regularly, one of the things she said was, um, it's amazing that in the midst of um, the horrific oppression that was going on at the time and the peril that everybody in Varian's organization was in, um, he and his clients, these surrealist artists um, and writers, um, staged so many revels. They found ways to have a great time. Um, there was music, there were art exhibitions, um, there were surrealist games. Um, and despite the fact that there was no food, there was plenty of drink. And so there were a lot of dinner parties where there was very little to eat, but, um, but things got rather raucous. Um, and uh, reading about some of those experiences in Varian's memoir, I just thought, well, I'd love to kind of bring to light some of the, in some of those scenes, some of the tensions between the peril that these artists and writers feel all the time and their need to remain human beings and to continue to live vibrantly in the world. Um, and so I think one of the ways that the surrealists did that was to, um, you know, to create these games that brought out this chthonic, earthy energy um, that was about, you know, sexuality and fury and um, mystery and and subjects that were taboo. Um, but what the other thing that comes out over the course of that dinner party is that the man who very and Fry falls in love with in Marseille, re falls in love with, the person who he had been involved with in college, reveals during that dinner party that he's black. Um, he's been passing for white for many years, something that Varian has known, but that nobody else at the dinner table has known. And while I wanted the novel to reflect the truth of Varian's having to hide his identity as a gay man, I also wanted the person who was sort of forcing him to confront that identity to have something that he was hiding as well. Um, and there are many obfuscations in the book, as it turns out. I don't want to speak too much about others because they're kind of nested within the structure of the book. But, um, but I feel like when one character is pressuring another, when one character is pushing on um, the kind of moral compromises that another has made, it's maybe more truthful and more interesting if that person too is compromised in some way. And so 
um, there's a real sort of impurity, I think, an impurity of motive <laughs> um, in the relationship between those two characters, because both of them, I think, are trying to have confirmed the decisions they've made in their lives, both to reveal and to conceal. I, I, I also wanted to talk about the moral dilemmas that kind of feeds into, into moral dilemmas. And Marco, with your, with your narrative, the, the, the pressures that are being built around expectations because of secrets that are being told uh, or not being said. Um, it's, it's, it's forcing, it's, it, it, there, are, there are certain things that happen in the book um, where people end up hurt or, you know, something, something tragic happens. Um, but maybe it could have been avoided if the secrets weren't, weren't so held so closely. And I know that um, there, there are certain um, reasons why, you know, when you're building a bridge in Tracy's book, for example, you, you, you know, it's very scary and dangerous and people die. I think 263 people or something died in the building of the bridge. And then of course, with, with the, you know, deciding who who gets to go home, uh, what ref refugees are you going to pick? The ones who are artists, and the one there are plenty that aren't. Well, who who makes these calls? And so, I guess the question is: um, in each novel, the characters face these moral dilemmas: uh, who will live, and for those that die, is that death an acceptable casualty? And and we only have five minutes left, but um, if you if you could speak to that and how those situations enhanced your characters or, or moved the plot forward and then uh, whoever would like to speak to that i'll, I'll say ahead. something um i think the biggest moral dilemma of of the the whole project the broken bridge is as you mentioned jennifer people died and at the beginning of it you know a decision had to be made to do this knowing, I mean, you know, you don't know how many all die and what will happen, but they had to know that it was a dangerous process, building caissons deep below the water surface. I mean, that in itself was dangerous. And uh, they had built the bridge across the Mississippi and had lost people to a caisson disease already. Um, so they knew it was dangerous. And yet the decision was made to move forward. And, and still to this day, we do things you know, you go out and drive your car, people, you know, it's a, a big, one of the biggest killers is, is car accidents. And we, you don't stop doing it because then you would have to stop living anything except for living in a little shell all by yourself. So there's inherent risk in life and who makes the decision versus, you know, what risk is acceptable is, mm -hmm. you know, it, that's a, a, a timely question. And, uh, it, and I think it will always go back to is how important is whatever project, whatever we're going to do. Uh, are we going to save more people in the end if we have to sacrifice a few in the, in the beginning? You know, say well, for the bridge example, say we built this bridge and a hundred people died, but maybe we saved a whole bunch of people who didn't drown crossing the icy river. You know, maybe we saved a whole bunch of people because people could get uh, get to a hospital from the outlying borough into a good hospital because they drove across the bridge versus having to, you know, take an unreliable ferry. So, and just the development of an entire city, which was at, you know, before that was two different cities, just developing a whole community, you know, did that save lives? Did that create lives? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so it's always a, a big picture question, but uh, to me, that's the, the biggest moral dilemma is what risk is acceptable and how and why do we choose that? Thank you, Tracy. You're welcome. Marco or Julia? I mean, I'm, I'm happy to address that question because that was something that I really wrestled with throughout the writing of this book. Um, Variant dilemma was that his organization had limited money and he had limited time in France. And so how was he to determine who deserved aid? Um, nested in this book is a, a question about how we determine the worth of a human life. 
and how we measure human lives relatively. Um, what I think the book seeks to explore is the, the um, I don't know, the way it dawns upon us <laughs> that all human lives are of equal value. Um, and sometimes we, we have to cast ourselves out of, our, uh, out of the sense of our own importance. Sometimes it happens involuntarily through events like parenthood. Sometimes it happens through falling in love. Sometimes it happens through falling in love with art and falling in love with the idea of the creator of the art, somebody who continues to make seemingly impossible acts of art making uh, possible and part of our world. Um, and I think all of those things happen in this book um, in one way or another. Um, but the, the question is not solved in the book. It just becomes further complicated. Um, and really, when Varian's time in France ended, we, were we hadn't even yet entered the war. I mean, we really, as a nation, had not started engaging with that question in a way that was going to drive the decisions that um, our leaders made around the Second World War. Um, and uh, it was one that we were going to have to um, enter into very soon afterwards and with dire consequences. So in a way, I feel like the, the, the moral dilemmas inherent in the book foreshadow some of the larger questions of national responsibility that were going to come in, that were going to sort of submerge onto um, the political scene very shortly afterward. Um, and again, you know, we continue to wrestle with those issues today. Thank you, Julie. I'm, I know that we're, we've just hit our timeline. I want to thank you all so much for your partic participation in this panel and for joining us on call, call for the Book Festival. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you all. Thank, thank you, you for inviting me. Thank, thank you, you very much. much. I did. Take care.